Okay, the recording has started. So when it's done, the recording will be available. So you can watch this uh, if you want. So How do you get if, back to this and watch it? Uh, it takes, when we're done, it takes a little bit, but it'll be right in that same place where the purple is. Yeah. So I'll add a new one on Thursday. I'll leave this one up and I'll, I'll, I'll walk through it and show you. But the, the main thing we're going to talk today about is water, and there's definitely a question. Oh, dear, there's the clock going off. We'll wait. Okay, four, four bars. So we'll be done by five bars, I promised Luke. Um, so that Mickey Mouse molecule is important because the high, it's H2O, as you guys remember, and then we've got the oxygen, which is the bigger molecule, and then the hydrogen push over to the side. So it makes the molecule polar, so it makes it more positively charged on one side and negatively charged down the other. So that makes it the universal solvent. That makes it really important for all chemistry that we're going to do. And we, we all know from what we talked about with our photosynthesis equation, it's really, really important. And Zach was even talking earlier, it's going to be irrigation time. Irrigation is this. It's providing really the most important thing for plant growth. Uh, Ms. Westman knows, you know, without irrigating your greenhouse plants, you're not going to have plants for, for very long. So we're going to focus on that throughout this whole thing. But just remember, it's that polar molecule. And then I've got, here's a picture of the Hoover Dam. We went out there and you can see, you know, water can be scarce in places. So we need to be aware of that. And we'll talk about some ways to deal with that. And you all as being trained turf grass professionals are gonna have tools after this lecture that will help you uh, make good decisions about which water to use and which water to save. And uh, affluence is going to be a big part about what we, what we talk about for the future. And believe it or not, as, as low as, as, as scarce as water is uh, in the Pacific North, Northwest, there's really not much scarcity on the golf courses because they have been able to use effluent water. So there's a lot of people flushing their toilets, so they're allowed to use uh, that water. Okay, so... Uh, and you, this stuff is in the video. So here's the main thing. So this is what I wanted to talk about also. Can everybody see the one to 1 1.5 inches of water per week for normal maintenance? Yep. Yes. Okay, so that's really important for your project. That's the only number you really need. And, and we're saying, remember we're doing a budget. So if it rains, we're not going to irrigate, but we're going to budget for water just like we're going to irrigate. All the water has to come from irrigation. So if your grass is growing, uh, you want to budget that much water. And we'll be able, so you know the area of your field, you can figure out how many gallons it is to water, and that should be in your spreadsheet, and that should be adding up. So that should be pretty easy for everybody to do, and I'd like you to give that a try so I can help on Thursday. We can we can look at some and practice with that. But just try to get you know your area, how many gallons you'll need, uh, how many irrigation events per month, and then what's going to cost you per month to irrigate your athletic field. Does that does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's why it's in in red there. Um, and then I have to go back. This is a little bit annoying. Um, evapotranspiration, we're going to skip over that a little bit. Um, we'll talk about the desert. So this is old technology here, this weather pan evaporation. But uh, each crop will have a crop coefficient. So graduate students have figured out how much water is used. And you can measure how much water evaporates and then up it for how much the plants will use. But for our purposes, we're going to use that 1 to 1.5 inches and then try to spread the irrigation events out as much as possible. So that's that's the important thing is to water as infrequently and as deep as possible to try to get your grassroots down and to try to save water as much as possible. 
Okay, so that's the that deep, deep and infrequent that we've got here. So that's the other the other red uh, thing. Um, and by doing that, you're going to get much deeper roots. Uh, you're going to stimulate uh, ABA, one of our hormones we talked about earlier, which is going to help the roots grow down, uh, decrease disease. So all when you overwater, the roots are not going to go down. The plants will be succulent, and it's just a uh, disease waiting to happen. So holding back on the water is the is the really important thing. And that's you know whether you like or don't like uh, Pinehurst number twos. Uh, brown or color, they are going for water savings, which has been a nice rebranding thing for the for the club. Um, <laughs> say again, please. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't. French, we call it French toast. Okay. So you guys see the, uh, you know, irrigation, that's, that's one of the irrigation projects we've done in the past. I know you guys will get to do some with Mr. Westman this summer. And, um, you know, that's, that's, there's always, uh, if you know how to do that, there's always work for you. So the art of it is watching the plant. We're going to watch for will, uh, looking at the weather. You know, is it going to rain tomorrow? If it is, can we hold off another day? Um, and the, the best time to water is, is in the morning. You don't want the leaf tissue wet. Uh, that's going to bring disease. Uh, syringing, you know, you want to be you want to be careful with that. Um, it will cool the plant a little bit, but not for very long, and it's applying water. So if we get situations where the humidity is really high and the nighttime temperature is high, syringing can cause some problems because you'll get the stomates opening up. There's nowhere for that water to go. And that's called wet wilt. And that's probably the most scary thing a turf manager can ever see is wet wilt because there's there's not much you can do uh, besides hope for some wind or get some fans out there or something to uh, to help the plants. Because when those stomates are open and water's not moving out of the plant, uh, disease is definitely going to move in at that point. Um, and here we go. So what do you guys see here? Irrigation bricks for home. Right. So, so you get a call in this area is brown. What's going on? Why? Right. The head not turning. Yeah. Somebody knocked the head right off. So the head's shooting all that water down into the the woods. So the well, one of the problems is all these irrigation systems get put in and then nobody maintains them. So ninety percent of my home lawn calls I've ever gone on are because the irrigation is not adjusted properly. So. Uh, and where there's going to be some lots of examples of that as we move through this uh, lecture here. But I just thought that's a good example to see just how brown it is here. And that's just because this head is gone. So uh, somebody spent a bunch of money to put an irrigation system, but nobody maintained it. So sometimes species. Uh, and, then, and then this is this is a this is a test question. So which which grass uses the least amount of water of a list of grasses? That's going to be buffalo grass. And then another question I might ask you is which grass out of a list of grasses is going to be the most salt tolerant? Anybody want to guess at that one? You did Zach. Correct. Correct. Good job. So that's uh, so you know your grasses. So I'm trying to I'll keep trying to tie these grasses in. Uh, buffalo grass is not going to be a very good choice if you want a quality lawn, but if you want to save water. It's it's going to be your best. So if you ever get a job out uh, in the Pacific Northwest or in the West where you're you know in your rough or even for a home lawn that that would not it's it's not a quality grass, but it's going to work for that. Okay, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? All good. Be good? Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, so we're going to talk next week about airification, and that's going to be thatch. Thatch can cause some problems with, with water. A thatch layer is going to decrease your water infiltration. It'll have a mushy mass at the top, but it, it won't move down. So airification will help that, and we'll talk a lot about that next week.
Um, we've got some of our plant growth regulators we talked about earlier in the class. Uh, Cutlass and other plant growth regulators can give up to 20 to 30 percent of water. There's some called Wilt Prif. And I want to ask, Ms. Westman, do you have you ever used any of those products that are designed to decrease water use? Um, not on turf, personally. I do know that Southern Landscape Group utilizes a lot of plant growth regulators to reduce their mowing down frequency. Um, gotcha. The nursery industry does use a lot of um, what they call anti-desiccants when they dig trees, particularly gotcha. so depending on the time of year. Before they dig it, they'll spray it and it kind of coats the plant and keeps that moisture in. Yeah, I've never exactly. seen them use it in turf either, but it is an inter interesting concept. So, uh, you know, particularly wind, wind is going to be your enemy for drying stuff out. Right. Thank you. I, I've always been interested in that. That was something that was in the book. So some of our sources for water. So potable is our city water, and that would be the one you want to use least. And you know, we want to save that for, for drinking water for, for the people. Rivers, lakes, streams, Southern Pines is drinking water comes out of uh, uh, the creek, a creek, right? It's uh, a, a river. So, so that's, you know, with, that's a better source because once it passes the intake, it's gone. Uh, reservoirs, holding ponds, you know, on a golf course area is probably going to be your best. The best designed golf course is going to be like a bowl. So all the water will come back to the holding pond. So any chemicals or any fertilizers that you use will eventually be put back. Um, deep wells, uh, that that gets to be something I want to save as well. Uh, deep well water is, is thousands and thousands of years old. And then the one we're going to talk about a lot that I think is our best choice is sewage effluent. It does have some negatives. You're, there's going to be things in it. You need to test it and you need to know. But by knowing our fertilizer uh, analysis that we looked at and by knowing what's in the water, we can adjust our fertilizers and be able to use this. It also can do some damage to the irrigation heads but that's also job security for us too. So the sewage effluent is going to be one of the main things. And this is uh, Craig DeJong's golf course up in Northern Raleigh, and it's in a, in a subdivision. And this is the this is the wastewater treatment plant. So as they build the subdivision around the golf course, they've built the wastewater treatment plant right there. And all that wastewater has to be used, is going to be used on the golf course. And they built this giant retaining uh, pond for that for the effluent. Uh, and you see the pump station there. So that's that's the future for golf courses is, is effluent water, particularly out, out west. And I think so you guys all and built that plant and they just use whatever wastewater people create in their homes or whatever, filter it and use it on the golf course because there's like water regulations in Raleigh and whatnot. Exactly. So it's you know, all the toilets in the subdivision around the golf course flush to this mm -hmm you know, mini waste treatment right. plant, which makes it better because the big waste treatment treatment plants are you gonna be at the lowest point in the county if you think about it. So the cost to use effluent right. is not to get to, for the water, the cost is to pump the water wherever it's going. So Desert Mountain Yeah, Desert Mountain spent ten million dollars to be able to pump the sewage effluent back up the hill so they could irrigate with it. So you have to pump it up the hill into a pond and then pump it again through your irrigation system. Okay. But yeah, yeah, good question, uh, Zach. So there's some of the pros. Uh, you know, when, when there's low water, it can save you some money. It can give you a little bit of nutrients, particularly some calcium and magnesium. Uh, salt can be a problem, that stuff. Uh, cons, you know, the salts and that stuff can get too much. So human bacteria is probably the thing you want to worry most about. You know, you don't want people getting it on them, drinking it. You know, you have to put up signs to, to tell people, you know, not to get in it. And then uh, in a heavier soil, like in Raleigh, you're going to get a little bit of salt problems. You want to deal with that. In the sand, we're not going to have as much problem with that at all. And then another con, sometimes you'll get a contract where you have to use so much water 
and it's not at a time when you want to irrigate when it's been raining a lot so you need to have an area or a way to pump it into the rough or a low use area so you're not saturating your your fine sports turf so driving range gets to be an important place uh to use the effluent and then we've got this uh this purple pipe can you guys see the purple on these yeah there's pur purple on the head and then purple on that valve and then this is the pipe so anytime you're cutting into purple pipe you want it you know that that's effluent and to use so is use that extra. regular regular schedule 40 pipe or is it like a stronger kind of pipe because of i think it's about it's the same that's a good question i i don't know the answer but to me it looked the same other than they, they put here. Diane. Jim's here, Mike. You can answer that does, for you if you he, want. Does he know? It's just dyed. It's just a dyed color. So it's ain't okay. That's what I thought. Well, it's yeah. a quarter class color. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, yeah. so there's our math problem. And I'm going to skip this because we worked on it before class. Anybody that's still struggling with it will come back to this after class. Um, and then when we get into drought situations, this is, uh, so, so what, what problem do you guys see here? The intake is above the water. Yeah, the yeah, intake is above, above the water. So, yeah. uh, lots of golf balls available, but no water, no water available for the, the fairways. And, um, Sorry. Somebody whose phone's ringing, just cut off your microphone. Yeah. And um, and and that this was to me the best time I ever played Forest Creek because the fairways were brown, and um, the ball rolled rolled really far, which is good good for my golf game. But but uh, Bill had to go in there and they had to lower that intake, uh, to a to a lower spot to get to get water. Um, so here, what what problems going on here? It looks like no irrigation. Somebody didn't turn it off during winter. Yeah, they've, they they've got the irrigation on and it's, and it's freezing. So we see that a lot, particularly at places like CCNC where somebody schedules their irrigation to work every Thursday for uh, an hour or 15 minutes or whatever and never shuts it off. So that's uh, some to keep your eye on. And then... Um, so measuring soil water. So this is back to our, our soil section. Uh, and, and my guys should be doing that with their pots. So uh, before I forget, I want to see pictures of your, your grass uh, tomorrow, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. we, we have, we're going to have this section uh, for just turf students tomorrow at, at 3. And I want to see where we're at on this. Uh, gravimetric uh, wet minus dry divided by dry. And then volumetric, converting that over. Not important for our quiz for this week. Um, some other basic thoughts on, on water. 50 to 90% of the plants are water. Um, so it takes 500, 700 pounds of water to produce one pound of dry matter. So that's, that's a crazy number to think about. Um, and I think it's even higher than that for beef. Um, I think it's like 2,500 per beef. Yeah, it's a, it's just a crazy number. So uh, conserving water is something we're going to need to think about as we move forward. Uh, maybe not so much in North Carolina, but if you get a job uh, west. And then the, really the way to think about water from a plant standpoint is those stomata. So the guard cells, definitely the plant needs to have enough water to open the guard cells when the guard cells uh, get dehydrated, they are going to all close. So uh, when, when that closes, we know that can throw particularly cool season grasses into a horrible uh, state of uh, photorespiration uh, where they can't do photosynthesis and they'll, they'll starve to death uh, if we can't get those stomates open. So that's why that syringing and watering is so important uh, to the plant. Um, the plant can get to a temporary wilting point. We'll see that on turf grass is footprinting. I think everybody's seen that where you walk over the grass and it doesn't spring right back. Uh, that's one of the main indicators that it'll get purple and footprints will show. 
And uh, the other thing is that they'll start to roll. And you can really see that if you've ever driven by a corn field and seen where the, the corn is starting to get dry, it will roll up. And that's, that's a mechanism that the plant uses to try to conserve water. Um, if you get to permanent, that's temporary wilting point. And when you get to permanent wilting point, uh, I'm going to show some slides that will, uh, will help that. So, uh, so too much water. Yeah, this is, uh, so, uh, if you have too much water, the soil will go anaerobic. That means there's no oxygen and that is death to the roots of the plant. So the, the roots need oxygen to, to be able to respire and that's not going to happen. So, but we do have an example of a grass that grows just fine with no oxygen to the roots and that is rice. So that's a picture of some rice right there. And this is going back to my, uh, my PhD thesis. Uh, there's the rice. So what, what we did is we looked at uh, grass plants grown with no oxygen and they form a structure called a ranchoma. So this, this is not on the quiz, but it may be on the final. You might want to write this down. Um, it's A-E-R-E-N-C-H-Y-M-A. And that's the structure, right? Can you guys see my pointer? Yeah. Yeah. You, you can see. So this structure here. So we take these three cells and they, the plant sacrifices those three cells to make this channel. And it makes this big open channel down the root. And this is a cross section of a root. So if you took the root and then sliced it like a hot dog, this is the cortex and the xylem and phloem are all in this part. And then these outer cortical cells are sacrificed and oxygen can go down from there all the way to the root tip. So the plant can respire and grow even with no oxygen. So does anybody see a problem with that for a turf grass? Yes. What do I you do. think? It makes it, it makes it not able to stand up to uh, traffic or... Yeah, so the it, it, it's fine for rice because we don't have, you know, 100 people a day putting on it and walking over it. But when we do it in a turf grass, when this happens in a turf grass in our normal setting, it really, the roots will just shoot back. And that's what happens in the summer on bent grass in North Carolina. That's why everybody likes the Bermuda so much is because these these roots die. And, and on, the, on the nursery grain, we see that the roots are fine. So oftentimes you'll take a cup from there. Why are these roots all the way down to the gravel on the nursery? But on the golf course, there's there's no roots at all. And it's because if the plant switches over to forming these arenchyma, it can't withstand any traffic. And that's kind of the the dynamic that we're dealing with. So uh, that's just a little bit for understanding. It may be a little deeper than than most books, but I'm proud of these slides that I made back when I was in graduate school. So um Okay, so this, I'm going to skip now to this picture right here. Yeah, so this is, um, we're going to talk about this quite a bit. So this is, we look at, we're going to look at just one soil particle. So you can, you, you have to imagine that all of this stuff is round. And in, in connected to the soil, water is going to glue onto that. So that's adhesion. So when we have uh, uh, the water to soil is adhesion, and then we're going to have cohesion water, and that's water that binds to other water. And that's important. There's a quiz question about that. So adhesion is water. This is so. This is all water. And then once we get this far away, so it's as we move further and further away from the soil particle, we the water is held less and less tightly. So it's really hard to get the water away from the edge of the particle. And that's what our, my guys did when they dried their soil. They dried it all the way down. But the, the adhesion water is water that plants can never even get because a plant can't pull water past this negative uh, 31 bar. And then gravity is stronger than negative one third bar. So any water that's further away from the soil particle than that is gonna go down is gravitational water. So we'll have 
micropores will hold water. The micropores are the ones closer to the soil, and then the macropores are the ones that are always filled with air. So that's our 25, 25, 25% 25 uh, water, 25% air, and at field capacity. So field capacity is at negative one third uh, bar. So I know that's a little bit confusing, and you want to think of it spatially, but the really important things from this slide are knowing adhesion water is water to soil, cohesion water is water to water. Does that make sense? Yeah, so far. Yeah. And then grab, so the gravitational water will go down and it may become adhesion water or cohesion water to place lower in the profile. And now I'm going to show you some of those pictures as we move down. But this picture, this is one of the kind of amazing things to think about, that a plant has to be able to take water from its roots way down here where it's wet and move it all the way up to the top of the tree and then be able to move it out. So we need to use a lot of tricks to do that, and we're going to talk about that as we move uh, forward through here, but I want to show these pictures. So this is the first picture. So what we did here, this is sand and the dye was put in each spot, you know, two inches apart. And then we filled this. This is a reservoir of water you can see. So this is fully wet. And then you see how soil wets. So this water that filled in here actually went up. So by the water binding to the water, binding to the dry particles, it'll go up before it goes down. And then here we've got a wetting front. So this soil is all wet to field capacity. That, that'll be a negative one third bar, but this soil down here is not wet at all. And that's a, so, so everybody see how that's, the, you wet it completely and then the gravity pulls it down. So we'll see the water, we'll move it down more and more. But this is the, the, where the water was irrigated. So that's how, if you have a row of crops and say we're growing strawberries or something on top of this mound, the plant can still get water because the soil will wick that up. And then when we turn off this water, the soil will dry from the top down and it will pull water up from the bottom. And that's what roots are going to do as well. So knowing that you know gravity is going to pull it down, but evaporation, uh, transpiration, evapotranspiration are all going to pull water up and it'll go from a wet area to a dry area sideways. So water moves three dimensionally through the soil, uh, not just down. Uh, you can't half wet a soil. And this is a little aerification uh, for, for next week. If we have an aerification hole all the way to the top, we see that the water goes down that aerification hole and it helps wet the soil. If the aerification hole is sealed off at the top with soil on top of it, we see no water goes through that at all. So that just becomes a dry plug of soil. So we don't want to do that. That's the reason we want to fill our core aerification holes with sand all the way uh, to the top. Capillary oh, rise, we've got another. So, and it depends on soil as well. So. A sandy soil is going to wet with the same amount of water deeper than a loam, and then a loam deeper than a clay. And we've got, uh, so, so here's another red thing, and this we'll talk about a lot next week as well. Any sharp boundary between two layers of uh, dissimilar soil is going to cause a boundary. So water won't go through it, nutrients won't go through it even plant roots will stop going through it. So if we get layered soil uh, in any way, it will be a hindrance to plant root growth. And here's an example of that. So the, the water here, and it, it has to build up almost fully full before it will bust down into that second, that gravel layer. And then here's another, this is an example of a, vertical mulch. So the aerification hole filled with sand will increase the the water's infiltration, but if it's if there's soil over the top at all, it will not do that. No water will go into this area at all here of the coarser material. Okay, our root root morphology. Uh, we, we I'm not going to ask you about this stuff. 
uh, just knowing root hairs will go out there and grab extra stuff. And then one of the questions on the quiz, uh, sometimes mycorrhizal fungi will grow just like root hairs. And the mycorrhizal fungi is very good at helping the plant get phosphorus. And uh, we know phosphorus is good for any of the crops that are, are making, uh, making seeds or that we want to eat. So mycorrhizal fungi can help the plant uh, symbiotically for that. But this is that heavy growth area down by the root cap, down in the meristem, and that's where that oxygen is needed. So if there's a ranchima, those arenchima will come all the way down the cortex and allow oxygen to get to that root. So uh, we go back to this uh, model here again. So if the soil dries out where we lose all of this cohesion water and all the water is held to the soil particle by adhesion, that's going to be our permanent wilting point. So this minus 31 bar is permanent wilting point. If we get below that, the plant, the plant will die for any length of time. And then this hygroscopic water, that's not on the quiz, and I'm not going to ask you to know that, but that's the water that's held so tightly to the soil particle, you can't get it off there without putting it in the oven. And if you ever put soil in the oven, know that the chemistry of it, the soil particles will bind together and you'll lose all your soil structure. So it's really hard to wet a soil that has been dry to completion in an oven. So uh, you can read that. So here's one of our questions. So uh, how should we irrigate after from what we've learned today? Infrequent and deep. Infrequent and deep. Very correct. So uh, the longer amount of time you can put between irrigation events, the better it will be. Because what, what has a percentage of happening? Disease? Well, disease can happen if we water too much. That's true. But what would happen that would help us out? We would save us money. The roots are going to go deeper. The, the roots will go deeper, so that we'll have to irrigate less. So that's good. But let's say we wait. We can go 14 days without irrigating because we have good deep roots. But the golf course down the street can only go seven days. What do we have a better chance of happening? We're saving electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We're saving electricity. But what, what would happen that would allow us to even go 21 days or 30 days? Water usage. Right, we're trying to use less, but I'm, I'm trying to get this something that could happen You you that, that would allow us to go longer and longer. What if it rains? Rain. Yeah. Exactly. If it rains, right? Yeah, so we we can watch the we can watch the weather and try to span things out. So uh, if if it rains, so that's the, that was the thing I was looking for. Okay. So skip over that. So so if it's raining like an inch and a half in a week, then that's is that going to be enough water? Should be, yeah, it should be. If if you get an inch and a half of rain, that's that's a lot of rain. So yeah, uh, and you can you can adjust. So that that's the one thing that you know most superintendents really manage their water. The the first thing they do in the summer when they go to their golf course is they go look at the pump and see how many gallons came out. And they know about how many they scheduled for the night before, uh, and they they can tell. So they're on that irrigation every every day. Where homeowners sometimes don't do that and I, I think that's that's one of the big things it takes it's like anything else it takes takes uh attention uh the the, the better turf managers are the ones that pay the best attention right okay are we good do we do we want to take a little bit of a break and stand up or Let's see, I got stuff in the in the text here. Uh, Drowning Creek, yes, that was uh, Miss Blevins, great. Drowning Creek is where the, the water comes from for Southern Pine. So it's different and it's not, it's not a reservoir. Um, 
So what do we got? We'll probably go 10 more minutes. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm talking a lot. Uh huh. Okay, so we're going to talk about lysimeters. Um, and this is some science stuff, but my students, really what they're doing is a lysimeter. Um, and that's just a pot. So this guy here, he's weighing this pot. And by knowing the weight of the pot, and he weighs it every every day, he knows how much water is, is in there. And this, uh, this is a giant lysimeter. This was at Michigan State University. Um, at the Hancock Field Center. I'm sorry, I was going to take you guys out there to see this, uh, but the USGA put these in there. So they put these these little lysimeters, and then they put these great big ones. And they're a they were able to uh, they put uh, chemical they put fertilizer on this one when we were there, and the fertilizer was labeled with the radioactive isotope, and then they watered it in, and then they collect all the water that comes out the bottom of the lysimeter. This is a completely closed container. And it's actually on a giant scale so they can weigh it. But they looked at this to see if any of the fertilizer came through. And they, they didn't find any fertilizer coming through uh, this lysimeter, which was, was expected. Grass roots, uh, you've all seen the roots uh, in your pots. They're very fibrous and they're really, really good at taking nitrogen uh, out, of, out of the soil uh, and out of the air. So, uh, Okay, so you know what? We are going to stop here because uh, this is this is stuff we can talk about Thursday. I'm going to talk about uh, how to conserve water and uh, how to not have uh, your pond look like this. So this is to me, if if you're irrigating your turf grass with a pond that looks like that, uh, it's going to be impossible to have uh, quality quality turf grass there. But uh, we got caught up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming uh, and listening to this. I'm going to turn the video off now.